What is up there, fine humans? It is great to be with you here today. Big shout out to all of our campuses all around the world, online, online, and online. That's that's actually the only campus we have right now. But whatever, we're plowing through COVID-19 together, and I want you to know that you are not alone. We are pulling for you. We're praying for you. I know you're grinding it out as you're putting one foot in front of the other as we do this uh, whole COVID chaos business, but we don't ever want to waste a crisis. So we started a new series called Change by God, where we are trying to go through and start establishing some habits because a lot of us have extra time right now, and we are able to establish some, some habits that allow us to work with God to change our hearts. Now, let's be super clear. I want to be incredibly clear. Only God can save you and only God can change you, but that does not mean that he wants us to just sit idly by on the sidelines and watch him or wait for him to change things. He actually calls us to interact with uh, with him changing our hearts after we come to faith in Christ, okay? So receiving Christ, all grace, right? All faith right there, that's there. You don't cooperate with God in that. You cooperate with him as you grow. And the Bible says that we change from one degree of glory to another. And so today we're talking about prayer. Last week was about Bible. Uh, this week's about prayer. And people struggle with prayer, man, because a lot of times people pray for things and then nothing happens. And so Jesus kind of looks like a liar in several places in the Bible. Right? He looks like he's a liar. He looks like maybe he's He's confused. Maybe he he overpromised, but he's going to underdeliver. Here, I'll, I'll give you an example, right? In John 14, 12 through 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's about to be betrayed and uh, put on a false trial. And he's about to be crucified, and he's going to feel the wrath of God for the sins of the world. That's what he's going into. And then he's going to rise again on the third day, and he's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to reference that, so I want you to have the background. But this is all happening right before that, okay? So John 14, 12 through 14 Jesus is saying, truly, truly, this is emphatic, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, that's crazy because our church started a uh, reading plan. We're going to read through the New Testament in 90 days. We started it this past week. You should jump in with us. But I'm reading through that. We just started in Matthew. And in Matthew like 8 and 9 and 10, Jesus is doing all these miracles, right? He's, he's just helping people, doing just incredible things. And Jesus right here in John 14 is saying that if you believe in me, you'll also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do. Because I'm going to the Father, right? That's what I was just talking about. Jesus dies on the cross. He rises again. He commissions his disciples to go and spread his kingdom throughout the world and throughout history. And then he ascends back to the Father. And then he and the Father send the Holy Spirit to those who have put their faith in him. And so once all that happens, he says this in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. You see that, right? Like like I underlined right there, I will do. This I will do. That's in your Bible. I don't care what translation you've got, but that's Jesus saying, if you ask something in my name, I'm going to do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything, that's broad in scope, anything in my name, I will do it. So is Jesus lying? Right? Because you've asked for things. You have prayed for things that have not come to pass. And I have too. And so my question is, like, is, is Jesus confused? Again, is he overpromising? Like, what's What's the deal? And most of the time, what we conclude is not that Jesus is a liar or that he was confused. We just conclude that prayer doesn't work, which is really weird, right? Because we don't do that with other things in our lives. So for example, I have the remote control for this TV right here in my pocket. And I kept it just so that we could we could make this simple point here. So I'm going I'm to switch here. Right, I got my red power button. It's just a normal TV remote. Now watch this. I'm going to press the power button. And... Nothing is happening. You know what would be completely silly is if I was like, oh, man, remote controls don't work, right? Especially when I've got another one in my hand that's working another device in this room, right? So I've got my TV remote, and if I press the power button, I'm like, oh, nothing's happening. Remotes don't work. That would be silly, right? That's not how we act. If you sit down in front of your TV and you press the power button or the channel button or whatever, and your TV doesn't respond to that, you go looking for what's wrong. So with this remote... I would sit here and I'd be like, okay, something's wrong. So is the, is the little sensor thing covered? Is that why it's not working? Is there is there some other button pushed down? Is it is it uh, the batteries dead? Like let's let's look, let's look. Oh, the there are no batteries. That's what's going on because I took them out to make this point, right? I am responsible for why this remote doesn't work. I am, 
right? Because I pulled the batteries out to make this point. Here's the deal uh, with prayer. The Bible shows that uh, a lot of the time we are actually responsible for why our prayers don't work, why they don't do anything or accomplish anything. So that's where we're going to go with this thing today. But I want to start off by talking about desire uh, to pray and why people don't desire to pray. And I want to talk about a big, real real big acknowledgement of what the majority of people experience in prayer. And, and that's really this. People don't pray because they don't want to pray. Right? Why, why, why don't you pray? It's because you don't want to. You do the things that you want to do a lot of the time, right? But people don't pray because they don't want to pray. And they don't want to pray because their prayers accomplish nothing. Like, I, I'm not being snarky here, right? Okay, like, like, I would say the majority of prayers accomplish nothing. Like, the, the vast majority of the prayers that people throw up at heaven don't do a whole lot coming back down. And I, I don't have, like, like, stats on that, but that's kind of the common anecdotal experience or anecdotal evidence that I got from people's experiences, right? Uh, people that are hostile towards God, people that are skeptical or doubtful spend a lot of time saying, how much have you prayed for? How much has it done? And they want to know evidence. I, I think there's a lot of evidence out in the world, both in the religious spheres and the Christian spheres and the secular atheistic agnostic spheres that are going to sit and say, man, there's a lot of prayer going on and there's not a whole lot happening. And so my question is why, right? So people don't pray because they don't want to pray and they don't want to pray because their prayers accomplish nothing. That's, that's just kind of, kind of a real deal. But God is not a liar. Okay, I want to be very clear. God is, God is not a liar. Jesus is not confused and he didn't overpromise and underdeliver here. God is not a liar. So if our prayers accomplish nothing, right? If we're praying and nothing's happening, the problem is with us not God. Just like I pulled the batteries out of the remote, a lot of us have pulled the batteries out of our prayers. So here's the deal. Uh, we're going to talk about how God changes us today. We're going to talk about how God changes us through prayer. And I want to spend some time looking at why our prayers aren't affecting anything. When we pray, it just doesn't seem like anything at all is happening. And I want to give you some hope right off the bat. I want you to understand prayer is learned. Okay, prayer is learned. We are taught uh, by the Holy Spirit to, to pray and pray rightly and, and the, the conditions for prayer and things of that nature. If I sat down, just like anything else in life, man, if I, if I wanted to play a sport or I wanted to learn an instrument or I wanted to learn a, a business skill or a leadership skill or how to make videos and post them online, all those things are learned. Right? I, I went to guitar lessons early on as a kid, like sometime uh, eighth grade, right? I started guitar lessons. And if I sat down with my guitar, super awkward, unable to play, and I just sat down as like, I want to, I want to play Van Halen right off the bat, right? I want to play Van Halen's Eruption, just right, right off the bat. My guitar teacher would look at me like I was a fool. We don't approach other things like that in life, right? We gotta learn. We gotta, we gotta drill it. We gotta just kind of have real awkwardness and a lot of failure, but we persist through that in order to become effective at all of those things I mentioned, right? Sports, music, business, whatever, whatever your thing is. And it's the same thing with prayer. Now, Jesus does promise. We looked at John 14, <coughs> excuse me. So now let's jump over to John 16. And this is where he's talking, uh, where Jesus is talking about, I'm going to send heaven. I'm going to sit down at the right hand of God. And then we're going to send the, the Holy Spirit. And look at what the role of the Holy Spirit is. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Right? He will teach you how to pray. He's going to teach you how to um, come before God and pray in Christ's name and, and many other things, right? The, the truths about God are going to get you to pray in accordance with what God has actually revealed in his word, right? He will guide us into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, that's the Holy Spirit, whatever the Holy Spirit hears from Father and Son, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Prayers learned. That's great news. Don't be discouraged if you have prayed and had little success before, a little impact, little effect before. I'm hesitant to use that success word. Let's talk in terms of impact or effect, okay? Um, the disciples, when Jesus was here on his uh, earthly mission, when he was in the flesh and in his three to three and a half year earthly ministry, the disciples would watch him and they noticed that this guy outprays everybody and when he prays, things happen. And so look at what they uh, ask him in Luke chapter 11. It says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now look, these guys have been praying all their lives. 
Now, these are dudes that grew up, they, these are good little Jewish boys, they've been praying and, and reading Old Testament all their lives, and they notice something different about Jesus. So they go to him and they're like, Jesus, we want to pray like you pray, right? We want to have uh, the effect that you have on this dark world. We want to bring light into the darkness just like you do. So Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples, talking about John the Baptist there. And so Jesus teaches them in verse two, he says, and he said to them, so Jesus said to the disciples, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, holy and set apart is your name, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, that's going to be important, we're going to talk about that as far as what our aim is, give us each day our daily bread, we're going to talk about our motivations, right, we're going to talk about what all we're asking for right now, he's talking about sustenance, right, and the ability to accomplish the mission, okay, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, Right? The Bible is very, very clear that all of us have sinned. Now, what sin is, is it's disobedience towards God and it's selfishness towards others that destroys me and those around me. Okay, that's what sin is. And the Bible says all of us are guilty. We're all in that boat. The only person who never sinned was Jesus. And so he's teaching us to pray. He says, forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us pretty important there that you need to be gracious and loving and patient with others, even if they don't deserve it, okay? And lead us not into temptation, okay? So you've got the disciples going to, to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us to pray, and he kind of gives this, this model that I want to work through in reverse order. So we're going to go backwards through this. We're going to start with sin. We're going to hit the da daily bread motivations piece, and then I want to talk about the kingdom of God and what it means to actually pray in Christ's name. The goal here is that you become passionate about prayer and effective in prayer. Uh, I, I, as a pastor and a Bible teacher, I, I request that you pray for me, pray for our church, pray that we would be able to fill, uh, fulfill the mission that Christ has called us to. My, my hope and my prayer is that you're praying for uh, your relationships, right? That's, that's spouses or parents or siblings, uh, your friends, your children, your coworkers, that you begin to pray for um, insight and wisdom and and morality and ethics in our government. And we just are hoping and praying, we're pleading with God that you would become effective at prayer. So let's work ourselves back through this thing. If prayer's learned, what we're going to do is we're going to pray and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit some questions. All right. The Old Testament talks about, oh, there's a prayer in the Old Testament that says, God, search my heart and show me if there's any thing in me that is offensive to you, show me any any grievous way in me, point out any sin, right? And so we're going to ask God to, to search our hearts. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us these things. So first thing that we want to ask the Spirit, okay, is this, am I walking in sin? Remember Jesus' prayer. He, said, he taught the disciples to say, forgive us our sins uh, and lead us not into temptation, right? So we're just going to start there. Am I walking in sin? So this is going to require some humility, a lot of us have been taught that no matter what, I'm never wrong. You never admit you're wrong, right? You never claim ownership over anything that's gone sideways. You're always right and you answer to nobody. Well, that's folly and that's foolishness and you know that's not true, right? You know that's not true and God knows that's not true and I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm letting you off the hook here. You can just knock that nonsense off. When we go before God, we want to come with humility. We want to say, God, we have sinned. Now, if we've got sin in our lives, if we're walking in sin, persisting in sin, then we should not expect our prayers to be answered. Okay, if, if we are persisting in rage or lust or greed or apathy or laziness or gluttony, if we are just running from God, we should not expect our prayers to be answered. Look at James chapter 5. James is toward the end of your New Testament. And uh, he, was a, he was a pastor in Jerusalem. He's a half-brother of Jesus. And he's writing to, uh, to other Christians, and he's talking about the effectiveness of prayer. Watch this promise. In verse 15, he says, uh, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. That's powerful. Like a, like a, like a prayer in faith, in trusting relationship, allegiance with Christ, in faith and fidelity to Christ, will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. It's a big statement. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. That's an even bigger, bigger statement, right? It, it, prayer has the power to forgive sins. That's incredible. 
Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay, so we're talking about confessing to other brothers and sisters in Christ here. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of a righteous person, are you walking in sin? Right, you, this is one of the very first questions we want to just ask. Is, is, is there anything in my life that is offensive to God? God is not going to bless that. He's not going to honor that because he loves you. And so if you're doing things that harm yourself uh, or those around you, right, other people that God loves, God's not going to be like, oh, yeah, let me just give you whatever you ask for. Let me enable and empower you to continue to destroy yourself and others. That's a pretty straightforward concept. Anybody that's coached a team or taught students or had kids understands that concept. You don't reinforce the bad behaviors and bad habits. Right? If you want good for someone, you don't celebrate the things that are destroying them. So God doesn't answer prayers. Uh, First Peter also just reiterates this. I wanted to throw uh, this in just to color in this idea a little bit more. First Peter is a letter from Peter. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Uh, he says, the end of all things is at hand. Okay, now this is just, this is different. We can't go on this rabbit trail, but just, I want you to notice that the Bible uses the end of all things differently. This was written 2,000 years ago now, almost 2,000 years ago now, okay? And he's saying the end of all things is at hand. He's not confused about the second coming, all right? You gotta go, you gotta go chase that one on your own. Okay, turn off the TV, go check that out. Okay, he says, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. All right, there's an urgency here. Be self-controlled and sober-minded. Do the right things, think the right things, Keep yourself ready for the Lord for the sake of your prayers, right? For the sake of your prayers. Why? If my prayers, uh, if I want my prayers to be effective, if I want them to actually bring light into the darkness and to change me and change horrible circumstances around me, then I need to be self-controlled and sober-minded. I need to put to death my sin. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers the multitude of sins, which brings us to our second thing. Look at his motivation and why you would keep yourself holy so that your prayers would be effective. It is to love others. So that gets us to the second thing we want to ask the Holy Spirit, which is ask the Holy Spirit, is my motivation for what I am praying selfish? Right? Jesus said, pray for your daily bread, right? Give us this day our daily bread is what he prayed. And so what you're seeing there is sustenance. Right, what you're seeing there is what you need to get the mission done. Jesus has saved us. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that we're saved by grace through faith. That's in verses 8 and 9. But then in verse 10, it says four good works. Like you're redeemed for a purpose. You are redeemed to, to come on mission and fight on the side of the good guys. You've been invited into a battle. It's not bullets and blades and bombs, right? Not that battle. It's a battle not against flesh and blood, but in the spiritual realms that have effect on the world and flesh and blood. But I want you to get that Jesus has invited us into these things. And so when you pray, uh, when, when you're in that battle, Jesus says, pray for what you need. You need clothing, Got it. You, it. Like Matthew 6 talks about this. You need clothing, you need food, you need shelter, you need water. There's things that you need to get the job done. Are you praying for those things or are you praying for selfish things? Are you praying for vain things and silly things? So is my motivation selfish? James, we're going to go back to James, chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. He's talking about prayer and he says, you ask and do not receive. This is what we're trying to diagnose here, right? Like I pray and nothing happens. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, right? There's a way that I'm asking. There's a motivation. There's a, there's a, there's a purpose behind my asking and it's wrong. And he defines it. He says to spend it on your passions, right? Not on good works, not on bringing light into the darkness, not on making disciples, not those things, but selfishly, it's selfishly motivated. What is in it for me? God, take care of me. Take care of number one to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, it's, it's not meant in any words. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? What's he talking about? Look, Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world. That does not mean, that does not mean, that does not mean that it has no effect on the physical world here and now in history. Okay, that is, that is a terrible interpretation of that verse. Okay, he's saying here when Jesus says, that my kingdom is not of this world, it means that the goals are different from this world and the methods are different from this world and the ethics are different from this world. 
Okay, but a lot of times people will will come in and what James is talking about, he's talking about people who have committed their lives to Christ and he's saying, hey, your goals are the same as this, this dying rebellious world and your methods and your ethics are the same as this dying rebellious world. And so James is saying, man, you're being adulterous, like you're cheating on God. Do you not know that being friends and taking on those goals and those ethics and those methods is enmity? That's, that makes you an enemy, right? That uh, it is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world, okay, again, just, just out aligning myself, aligning myself with the world uh, and giving allegiance to the world makes himself an enemy of God. So obviously your prayers aren't going to be answered. So is your motivation selfish? right? Um, just, just silly things, right? We need things of this world. We've already talked about that. God's called us on mission and we need to be praying for that daily bread. God, here's what I need in order to make disciples. Here's what I need in order to uh, bless and love the least of these. Here's what I need to be light in the darkness and, and salt and light in the world, right? Here's what I need. That's what I need to be praying for. Um, interestingly, I was studying for this message this week and I sat down at dinner with my kids and I, I thought I'd just ask because it was on my brain from the message. I said, hey, Kids, if you could pray for anything in the world and you could ask Jesus for anything and he would give it, what would you pray for? Right? And my daughter pipes up. She's six years old and she goes, oh, dad, I, I know, I know. Ice powers. And I'm like, ice powers. Why would you pray for ice powers? And she goes on to tell me that. And my son, my, my four-year-old, he's about to be five this month, my, my four to four-year-old pipes up and he goes, oh, I'd pray for fire powers, right? And so I could overcome her ice powers. And so they're just, they're looking for powers, right? And, and the whole reason for this that they give is entirely selfish and it's childish, right? It's silly when I give you this example, but, but here's what's real. If I can just kind of like be straight with you for a minute, like a lot of us never grow out of that. A lot of us are looking for prayer to give us special power to just do selfish things and vain things and, and, and silly things and things that are just off mission with God, which leads us to our last question that we want to ask the Holy Spirit and that is that, or and that is this: um, Is my request aligned with Jesus' mission and method? Right, with His mission and His method. Am I in alignment with Him? Am I actually pursuing what He is pursuing? Right, Jesus came here and He died on the cross to glorify God and to save us and to redeem us, and He rose again on the third day, and then He ascended into heaven. He sits down at the right hand of God, and He's sit, sitting there, risen and reigning on high, and He's invading the darkness. That's His mission. He came to seek and save the lost. Uh, in, in Revelation, it says, "I am making all things new." Present tense, present progressive. Right? I'm making all things new. That's happening, and He invites us into that. And so, I would ask you this: Are you on mission? With God, I want to look at that uh, that statement that Jesus made early on in in this message that we first looked at, and I want to look at one particular phrase. Right, so back in John fourteen thirteen and fourteen, he says, "Whatever you ask in my name, in my name, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, in my name." I will do it. So that in my name phrase is very important. Now, what we typically do with that is we pray whatever we want to pray. If we're in sin or we're asking selfishly, it doesn't really matter. As long as we pray in Jesus name, I pray. Amen. And we think that's praying in Christ's name. What this is, is old kingly, um, courier messenger type language, right? I send somebody out in my name, if I'm a king and I send somebody out in my name, they're showing up in the name of the king. Here's the edict. Right? I come representing the king's interests and his mission and, and his ethics and his ways, his morals, his values, right? his aims, right? all of his mission. So when we go before God, what Jesus is saying, if you come on my mission, if you come in my name, my methods, my ethics, my mission, my my effort to push back the darkness and to redeem this world and to make this world new, right? I'm making all things new and to seek and save the lost and make disciples, right? That's my mission. When I come like that, then God says yes. Then God says yes. Look at 1 Peter. All right, so back to 1 Peter chapter 4. He's going to talk in the context of suffering here and he's going to talk about how we live and if we're in Christ, we no longer live for our own desires and passions, but for his mission. Here we go. 1 Peter 4, 1, uh, 4, 1 through 2. It says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, right, our Messiah, 
our God, our Savior, our Creator, since Christ suffered in the flesh on our behalf. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Get ready to suffer. Right? The mission that God calls you to is going to cost your life. This is why Jesus says you have to take up your cross to be my disciple. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Our Messiah, our God, our Savior suffered. Get ready for that. There will be suffering in this world as we pursue him. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Watch this in verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions. What's your mission? What, like, what are you living for? Right. But not for human passions, but for the will of God. Okay. What mission are you on? Right. With your life. If you're praying and nothing's happening, first, is there sin in my life? Second, are the things that I'm praying selfish? Third, am I living on mission with God or am I just like, hey, God, thanks for saving me. Can't wait to see you at the end of life on the other side of the grave. That'll be great. I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to go live for me. My whole life is now about me. My life is now about my efforts and my aim. Right? A lot of times we pray and ask God to come off course with his mission. If you can imagine like, like God's going down a road on his mission and you're hanging out over here in a field and you're like, hey God, come over here. And you're like, want God to come off mission and bless you in doing his thing over here. When what he's called you to, to be a disciple of Christ and to have allegiance with him as you leave your project and you join him on mission in his name. On his mission, his methods, his ethics, his aims, his goals, his ways, all that. Right? I leave my thing. I join him. Now I'm working alongside Christ. I'm cooperating with Christ to make disciples, be salt and light, then all those other things that we've been called to. And now I pray and I ask for what I need in order to get these things done. I've left my sin. My prayers are for the glory of God and for the good of others. And I'm walking on mission with him. Now, a lot of times we pray for things that are totally opposite than that, right? This this might seem snarky, but a lot of times we pray and we're like, God, please just give me more money. My trust is in money. Please give me more. Like Really? Like God is not going to give you that God, God, I know you've called me to to see the pain and the injustice in this world, and you've called me to to heal the pain and to confront the injustice, but God, I just pray that you would help me avoid that instead. God, help me to comfort and insulate myself. God, God, I know you've called me to know you and love you and to value people, but God, I pray that you would give me more distractions instead. God, I, I, I pray for these things. God, I pray that you would help me Worship me and put me first, even though you call me to put others first. Now, look, let, let's, let's be serious. Nobody prays that. Right? Not, not verbatim like that. Not with those words. But a lot of times, many of the things that we ask for, when we look at our motives, when we look at the mission that we're on, then it really is that. It's I want to take care of me. I want comfort. I want to insulate myself from the hard, dark realities of this world and... Jesus says, that's not praying in my name. Peter, right here, he's saying, hey, listen, you're, you're going to suffer to be on mission, but we're not going to live for worldly passions anymore. We're not going to live for what we want and our comfort. We're going to live for the will of God. And the will of God is to bring light into the darkness, to engage the darkness. That's what you've been saved for, according to Ephesians 2.10. Right? Saved by grace through faith alone, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. For good works is the very next verse, Ephesians 2.10. You have been invited in to mission. So here's my big idea for today. Here's what I want you to, to process through. Right? God calls us to persist in prayer. Remember, we were talking about practicing. We were talking about how prayer is learned. God calls us to persist in prayer until our wills, behaviors, and requests align, come into alignment, and are submitted to his purpose, ethics, and methods. Okay, so you've been praying and nothing's happening. That's okay. That's a great place to start. The key is to persist. Don't lose heart. Keep working at it. Now, you need to pray through those three things that we just went through. We need to pray, God, is there sin in my life? God, are my motives selfish? God, am I on mission with you? And when God speaks and and it's um, this conviction, it's like this knowledge that you have, like, no, you're off course, right? Then get back on course. Repent, turn, turn away from that, right? Turn away from your sin, turn away from selfish motives and turn away from being off mission and ask God to forgive you and get you back on track. 
to cleanse you from your sins, to purify you of your selfish, selfishness and make you loving instead, and then to get, get on board with the mission, right? So we want to persist in these things and pray. Now, Jesus tells a story about persisting that I want to look at in Luke chapter 18, and he's talking, and this is a parable here, and I'm going to explain what this means um, real quick because he's going to talk about an unrighteous man, and he's not saying that God's unrighteous, but we'll get there. Let's look at this. So Jesus tells them this, this parable. It's a story with a point to the effect that they ought always pray and not lose heart. Okay, so we, we want to always pray. We want to persist and not get discouraged. So many of us have gotten discouraged. We pray, nothing happens, and we lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. This is a bad guy. Okay, this is a bad guy, and he's a judge, so he's got authority. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, the unjust judge, and saying, give me justice against my adversary. So she's got some complaint, and she's asking for justice, and what she's asking for is legitimate. But she's going to an unjust judge. All right. For a while, I'm in verse 4 here, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. All right, this is an unjust judge. This widow has been wronged in some way and she just keeps coming. She keeps knocking, keeps going, keeps going at him. And he finally breaks down because he gets just annoyed and irritated and his impatience gets the best of him. Okay? And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. This is important. This is what an unrighteous, evil judge does. And will not God who is righteous, who is just, who is good, Give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, the whole reason he tells us this, he started at the beginning. Look at the top line. Always to pray and not lose heart. He's talking about persistence. He's saying even if an if a, if a evil, corrupt, unjust, uncaring, unloving judge will grant this widow justice, how much more will God, who is loving and is just and is patient and is kind, how much more will he give these things? And so we want to persist in prayer. Look, our persistence, when we keep coming to God, when our prayers have been ineffective, is a commitment to come to him and say, God, just, just refine me. Right? I want to be refined. I want to learn. I want to grow. My prayers are being ineffective, but I want them to be effective. You can pray that. You can say, God, I'm, I'm so frustrated. I'm losing a heart, but I'm going to keep coming and ask that your Holy Spirit would teach me to pray. Teach me to pray as I read the Bible. Teach me to pray as, as the Spirit moves in me and changes me and, and shapes my heart. Our whole series right now is about being changed by God. And so when we persist in coming before God, he changes us. It's a commitment that he has given to teach us and train us if we will continue to show up in front of him, put ourselves in his way, right? We keep doing that. And so my prayer for you is that you will continue to persist past your frustrations because, man, big things are at stake, All right? Big things are at stake. I, I, I want you to understand that God has called us to invade the darkness. God has called us to pray and have an effect on the darkness and evil and injustice and corruption of this world here and now. And the way that we do that is by making disciples of Christ, right? We go out and we take the gospel, the good news that God has, has judged our sin, but has also provided payment for our sin in Jesus Christ. And when people come to faith in Christ, they're set free from their sins, and when they are set free from their sins, it changes the way that they relate to rape and uh, addiction and to suicide and to domestic violence and to sex trafficking and to all these evils that are plaguing us in this world. Right? That's what's at stake in you learning to pray. That is what is at stake in you learning to pray. That you become effective in prayer in order to affect these things. So in conclusion... Here's what I want to ask, right? Because we're talking about our prayers having an effect on this world here and now. And it's this, if God gives good gifts to his children, but frequently says no to me, then I need to ask two questions, okay? If God gives good gifts, which I'm going to look at one story to wrap us up here, 
Uh, if God gives good gifts, but he frequently says no to me, then I need to ask two questions. First one, am I asking for a bad gift? Let's look at the passage. Jesus in Matthew 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Right? Or, if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then who are evil, <laughs> just, just, just not big into that snowflake gentle language, right? If you then who are evil, right, not righteous, not pure like God is, not completely holy like God is, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, am I asking for a bad thing? Am I asking for something that's going to harm me? Am I going to ask for something that's going to harm others? Am I going to ask me for something that's going to increase my distractions? Am I, got, am I asking for something that is going to pull me away from God? Am I going to ask for something that's bad? God's going to say no because he gives good gifts. So, ask God to teach you how to ask for good things. The second question that I need to ask is this, if God gives good gifts to his children, but frequently says no to me, then I need to ask, second question, am I a child of God? Like, this is a serious question. This is the starting point, okay? I know it's pop culture and it's just common to say, man, everyone is a son or daughter of God, but that's actually not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches in John 1 is that to all who did receive him, and it's Jesus that we're talking about here, who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children and children of God. Like the, 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 the ability to look at God and say, Father, who is in heaven, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The ability to call God Father comes by first receiving Christ. And so my question for you is this, have you received Christ because if we haven't done that, then, then there's no reason for God to give us anything if we continue to persist uh, in hostility towards him, if we continue to persist in, in apathy towards the, the pains of this world, if we continue to not live on mission, uh, Christ's redemption to seek and save the lost and to make all things new and to invade the darkness, right? If we continue to go at those things and not give allegiance to Christ, to turn from our sins, to not put our faith and our trust in Christ, then we should not expect God to treat us as children and give good gifts to his children because we're not his children, right? We are not his children at that point. So have you begun a relationship with Christ? If you've never done that, I want to walk you through a prayer right now. Um, we'd love to hear response from you if you pray this. Uh, there's nothing magical about these words. This isn't an incantation. It's not even in the New Testament. I'm just trying to help you wrap your mind around how God wants to relate to you. It's three things, A, B, and C. Uh, we admit that we've sinned against God. Uh, sin, again, is just uh, disobedience towards God, selfishness towards others that harms me and those around me, right? And all of us have done that, and it incurs God's justice. God hates when things destroy us or those around us, and so God is hostile towards that. But we believe that Jesus Christ is our payment for our sins. So we believe that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again on the third day, and then we commit to follow him as king all the rest of our lives. We commit to live on mission with him. We admit that we've sinned. We believe Jesus came to pay for our sins as the son of God, and we commit to follow him as the risen and reigning king. So I want to walk you through this prayer right now where you can receive Christ if you have never entered into relationship with him so that you can call God your father and you can begin to pray for his blessings, for him to give you good gifts as his child. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I admit that I have sinned against you. You can just say that where you are. I admit I have sinned against you. But I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. And I commit to follow him as king. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who did come out of heaven, who died on the cross after living a perfect life for our sins and then rose again on the third day. We believe he was the son of God and we commit to follow him as king. God, I pray for people that have committed their lives to Christ, be it just right now or who have been following you for decades and decades, that we would all become great in prayer. You promised to give good gifts to your children. And those of us who have 
committed our lives to Christ are your children. You say as much and we trust you for that. And so God, we know when you promise something uh, will happen from our prayers, if things aren't happening, that's not on you, that's on us. So teach us and train us in your ways. We pray these things humbly in your name. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. If you have been stagnant in your prayer life, if you're stuck in discipleship, man, we would love to talk to you. You can reach out to us by private messaging us on social media. You can fill out the the virtual communication card if you're watching on our online campus, or you can email us at info at onemissoulachurch.com. And we would love to help you take next steps in your relationship with Christ. And we'd love to join you in prayer as you seek to grow in the things of God and grow in your knowledge of who he is and your effectiveness in the ministry that he is calling you to. And so please know we are praying for you. We are pulling for you and we love you. God bless.